Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 108 of Dial the Gate. That rhymes. My name is David Reed. Thanks so much for uh, joining me. We have J.C. Vaughn, Jeff Vaughn, and Mark Haynes uh, waiting in the wings here, Stargate Atlantis and Universe uh, Comics writers. We're going to have them on for this episode. So if you have read the comics or you haven't read the comics and have some questions for them, uh, this would be the time to ask for this episode. Let me pull this up here. If you like Stargate, and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, it would mean a great deal if you click that like button. It makes a difference with YouTube's algorithm and will help the show grow its audience. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. Giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops and you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next few weeks on the Dial the Gate and GateWorld.net YouTube channels. As this is a live show, uh, I will be asking our guests questions and giving you an opportunity in the live chat at youtube.com slash dial the gate to submit questions. Our moderators are standing uh, by waiting to uh, take your questions down and submit, the no- submit them over to me. Anthony and Tracy are both there now. Without further ado, let me bring in my guests for this hour. Mr. Mark Hines. Is it Hines or Haynes? Haynes, please. Mark Haynes. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> and Jeff Vaughn, JC Vaughn, uh, Stargate, Atlantis, and Universe Comics. These were released through myth- American Mythology. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Well, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for uh, for joining me, Mark. Well, thanks for having us. Can, Mark, <laughs> can you give here. me? Thank you. Can Mark? Can you first give me a little uh, bit of uh, background about you, and, and then um, Jeff, please. Yeah, um, I started, you know, writing comics. Um, Jeff and I actually worked together um, at a magazine in the what late 90s called Overstreet's Fan. It was a, a competitor, competitor to a magazine called Wizard. Um, and even before I had met Jeff, I, I was an art director on that magazine, assistant art director. And I happened to lay out a story that he wrote about Superman versus Aliens, which was the big DC event that was happening at that time. And... Um, you know, we, we became friends and then just as our kind of work alongside kind of in the periphery of the comic book business, uh, you know, we started writing different things together and we were invited to pitch to Star Trek Enterprise. I'm sorry, Star Trek, um, Star Trek Voyager. Um, yeah. And then I went along on to pitch to Enterprise, um, and, you know, that's really kind of what got us into the writing thing. We were roommates for a little while when we both lived in the Baltimore area. And then I think the what really got us started in doing this in a serious way was Jeff was a big fan of the TV series 24 with Keeper Sutherland. It was on Fox in the early 2000s. Um, and then, you know, I thought it was a gimmick. I was like, oh, this sucks. I'm not interested. Oh, pardon. I've got to watch. I'll watch my language. You're fine. <laughs> but um, um you know, I just didn't think it was going to catch on. And then at one point he was out of town, but he bought the DVDs. So I, I binged them through the weekend and was hooked. And what, coincidentally, the two biggest successes we had writing comics, which were, for me anyway, was 24 and Stargate as we were writing them together, are both things that I was not interested in before he asked really? me to check them out. Yeah, I mean, I'd seen the movie with Kurt Russell and James Spader, and I was like, oh, this is great, you know? And, and then the TV show started. I didn't. I didn't and couldn't afford Showtime right. when it came on. So I was I convinced myself I was not interested. And then at one point, I think he was somewhere and he saw it. And he's like, you should really check this out because it's kind of funny. And uh, But it's uh, there's like this serious undertone to the story. And again, it was one of those things that, um, you know, I checked out on a free preview week or whatever. That's and, right. Um, the Showtime. Yeah. Free, that's right. The free weekends. You know, and so, so that the rest, as they say, is history. I mean, uh, you know, I look back on my writing career and I think almost better than better than half to three quarters of the writing opportunities I've gotten on cool things like Stargate and 24 have come through Jeff, you know, so, <laughs> so that's how, that's how I got here. <laughs> Jeff, any blanks you want to fill in? Yeah, you know that's it, it's. I, I never think of it that way, because Marcus, 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 creative on so many fronts. Um, he's a, a, a highly 
this is going to sound condescending. I don't mean it that way. He's a highly competent designer. I mean, like he on a whim can do stuff that takes people weeks to put together. And it's always really cool to see the way his brain works on something and tries to perfect it. And he does it so much faster than most people. Uh, Mark's right in in how we met. I had been uh, freelancing for uh, Overstreet Publications and Bob Overstreet sold his company to Steve Jeppy. It became part of Gemstone Publishing. And they oh, were creating- for, for, for people who don't know, Bob Overstreet created the Overstreet Comic Book Price Guide, which yeah. is kind of the Bible for oh, aftermarket comic books. okay. So, yeah, yeah, even I know what that is, and I, I'm not <laughs> huge. Okay, yeah. He, yeah, uh, yeah it's yeah, like Bob Kelly Blue Book for new, comics. It's a yes, very, exactly. <laughs> very good fill in the blank there, Mark. Uh, Bob created the Price Guide in 1970. And uh, while he is still in, uh, while he's in his 80s, he's still doing it. <laughs> and and this is a guy, this is a guy, and and who, and the talk about the power of being a fan, just to diverge for just a second here. Bob was a fan of the EC comics, Tales from the Crypt, Weird Science, all those things like that. Wow. Somebody would have done a price guide for comics. You know, every every niche has one if it lasts. It's a matter of time. Enough, yeah. Right. Yeah. But Bob was a coin enthusiast. And, okay. and so he used the logic of that and put together comics, but it, it wouldn't have been a Bob Overstreet without the EC comics. So that's the power of being a fan playing out now across, we're working on the 52nd edition of it right now. And so uh, I freelanced for Bob at his old company. He sold it to Steve Jeppy, who owns Diamond Comic Distributors uh, and they uh, for Gemstone Publishing. And Mark was the assistant art director and I sold my first cover story, which was for the first issue of this new magazine. And it was, as Mark said, Superman versus aliens, this great DC comics, dark horse comics crossover. Um, and I was psyched because it was my first cover story and I was still freelancing. And then I found out that not all of the people moved with Bob's company to Maryland and they, they had some openings. Uh, and I went up, I went up for the interview and I, uh, uh, I called my better half. Uh, we were in a long distance relationship at that point. I lived in Texas and this was in Baltimore and she's in New York. I called her that morning and I said, hey, am I taking this job? And she says, it's only eight o'clock. You haven't had your interview yet. I said, I'm getting this job. Do I take it? <laughs> and, and I met Mark that, that day. Uh, I think within two days, he goes, you don't freak out a lot, do you? <laughs> and I think we were really, really good friends from that that moment on. And we were both working with people who freaked out a lot, so we easily stood out to and each other. some of them, <laughs> and some of whom measured your enthusiasm by how much you freaked out, which is exact opposite of both of us were problem solvers. <laughs> and and uh, uh, we really uh, there's a lot of things we had in in, in common. We're both big Star Trek fans, uh, and. Uh, open to new sci-fi and you know just all you know a lot of pop culture stuff that was really good bonding material and then we got into um the opportunities to do to do some stuff and one of the great things is that mark is a really detail-oriented guy and he we got we we ended up acquiring uh, Mark really did, but we ended up acquiring a company that was publishing Battlestar Galactica comics. And this not is the original doing... Galactica, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> Classic. Um, um, but uh, we both loved it. I, I'm still I'm still hung up the fact that they interrupt on the East Coast. They interrupted the uh, pilot for the Camp David Peace Accords. I still haven't gotten over that. Um, but they. Mark would spend like serious amounts of time making the sound effects pronounce right in lettering. <laughs> so I mean, that's, is, how, that's, how, that's how much of a nerd we are. But, <laughs> but I mean, that level of that level of care. Yeah. He's always he's always our continuity cop. Uh, you know, I'll throw out ideas. And, you know, it's not that I don't remember that kind of stuff. It's just I'm lazy mm -hmm. because I know he's got it. Uh, and. And we did, we did uh, Jim Kahorik, who was our publisher mm. at American Mythology, was the writer, I was the editor, and Mark was the publisher, producer, letterer, designer, everything else that needed to be done. And we really, 
we really found good ways of working together on that. Though, because we were working with a bunch of other freelancers, there was no one set way that we worked uh, on it, which is sort of ended up being our approach to many scripts. There'll be scripts that the, that the idea is totally 50-50 or even more Mark, but I've ended up writing the script that happened on one issue of 24. Um, there's been stuff where we just go back and forth, back and forth, changing it a lot. And, you know, I'll write a pass, he'll write a pass, or we'll be on the phone and do it together. And so this actually bled over to when we got the opportunity to do uh, Stargate. I actually, I live in New York and Mark lives in Los Angeles. And we actually would, I would generally speaking, go out the week before San Diego Comic-Con mm. and crash with him. And we would just plot like crazy. And we'd do like a year's worth of plot right then. And occasionally we'd have stuff that Jim would want us to get in there and we'd have to work around either either make it work or say, you're out of your mind, <laughs> that kind of stuff. But that's how we got, that's or, how we got to start or, or we would say you're out of your mind and then we would make it work anyway. Well, that more likely, <laughs> more likely that's the case. Um, but we got to, as, as Mark said, we got to Stargate where I had checked out the original TV series and sort of found a soft spot for it. And... And the further it went, the more I liked it. I wasn't I wasn't totally in love with it at first, with the one exception of, well, of course, if it di- the gate will dial one place, it could dial a, a gazillion different mm-hmm. places, which when I was watching the original movie, it never occurred to me. I have to admit that. And yeah, so it's a that great was big combination that, lock. So yeah, yeah. It unlocks yeah. to one place. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> that's how I took it. Yeah. And then this <laughs> thing just explodes. So, yeah. Yeah. Mark, go ahead. Well, and then, you know, I think to kind of dovetail with what Jeff said in terms of (laughs) what he said uh, in terms of how it grows on you is that unlike a lot of other sci-fi franchises that I think are set in the future, you know, or or like Star Trek or, or long time ago in a galaxy far, far away as we're aware of, these are contemporary people. Yeah. So it's like, it's, it's half, you know, there were serious concerns that they were dealing with, but it's like mixed with a workplace comedy in some ways. And so it was just like, how, what's your reaction to certain things? And, you know, specifically with the character of O'Neill is, you know, everybody looks at Richard Dean Anderson and says that, you know, this was, he was born for this part. Like he took this part and turned it into something incredible because of the way they dealt with, uh, the death of O'Neill's son. Correct. In the show. And it drove everything. His smart ass attitude, his bucking of authority. He ne- he would never, you know, he'd push it to the line, but his irreverent take on things was masking that pain that he carried the entire time. I think and that's it, why the character works. Because yeah, exactly. we would look at this guy and go, you know what? This dude is just a smart ass. Yeah. If, yeah. if we didn't have the genesis of that character at the beginning, it's like, okay. This this guy has yeah. has transcended the worst pain a parent can ever have. And yep. you know what? Everyone around him just puts up with it. Yeah. Because <laughs> what else are you gonna do? Right. You know? He's right. very comp he's perfectly competent at his job and excels at it, despite all of his personal tra- tragedy. His life exactly. is a tragic comedy. Yeah. And and, 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 and there's a there's a there's a, there's a step fur- there's a step further with it you guys are both touching on, and that's this. There's this always this thing of shows around whether it's set in the past, the present, or the future. We need you back, mm. and and we're supposed to believe that Starfleet needs one guy out of an entire galaxy of people back, or what <laughs> you know, fill in the blank. They they need this, but Jack, having been the only CEO to go through a Stargate, yeah. They really, he really did have jobs. And it was true. That was, in that instance, that, that, it was true. That, that, that explodes that cliche and say he was the guy they needed back. Yeah. It's the call to adventure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, it's, I think what really brought it, um, I hesitate to use the word full circle on a Stargate program because, you know, anyway, that's, yes, I'll yes. just say <laughs> it's, it's been done to death and we're going to keep doing that. But what, um, one of our favorite episodes that Jeff and I, we each have our favorites out of all the series, but one that you can just keep going back to is window of opportunity. Of course. 
And, you know, and it's like, it's this really bizarre comedy for the first three quarters of the episode. And then when you finally get to, to what's happening and he's like, I lost my son. And you're just like, boom, it's there all the time, you know? And that's what it's like, that's when it really kind of hit me. It's like, okay, this show is something. And, and you know, it, what's, what's funny is that, you know, we wrote Stargate Atlantis and Stargate Universe for comics because our publisher was not able to get SG-1 at that point. You know, and he's it, all through while we were doing it, and even to this day, I think he's still attempting to negotiate. And I don't know how the the Amazon MGM mm -hmm. deal has affected that, um, <clears throat> but he's attempting to negotiate type of uh, some type of a, you know, a master agreement that would let us use those characters in that environment. Because one of the things that, and I'm maybe jumping around a little bit, but uh, we what we were able to do with Atlantis was. The directive we received from MGM was you can use any characters that appeared on Atlantis on the TV show Atlantis in the comic book, and it's like, well, that's almost everybody from from SG One, um, uh, with the exception of Richard Dean Anderson because he controls his own. He has his own rights. Yeah, I noticed so. in reviewing the content <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> Uh, there was a, a scene at Homeworld Command that it, it's pretty evident that it's Jack, but yeah. the Homeworld Command coffee mug is doing the talking. Yes. <laughs> we, Jeff. we had we had been told uh, <clears throat> that they would go to Richard for his approval, but they weren't going to do it for small scenes. Well, yeah. all we needed was small scenes. Right. That was his his contribution to Atlantis was generally just small scenes other than that the two part where he and Woolsey are trapped on the city which is hysterical I love that part but anyway go ahead Jeff and 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 and, and some of the some of the interesting things that we encountered uh, on our journey were things that had been described as other than what they were to us ahead of time <laughs> well, explain um, that um, <laughs> if you can, MGM, MGM would have a set of rules. Okay. And we would abide by those rules. And then we would be, ter be, ch be told that the rules had changed. Right. Sometimes we would be notified this after things were approved. So we would be, there would be things that were drawn and we would have to fix in lettering and just make up some oblique comment. Well, and it would be, it would be outline approved script approved pencils approved pencils get inked disapproved no rhyme or reason to it in any particular way it, it was it was hard to follow and it was really hard to fathom because you know for a large portion of our writing careers we've both had day jobs that we pursue you know and, and various capacities of different size businesses and so we we're always thinking like what is the business reasoning behind your position and they didn't really want to come clean or really share that because in a lot of instances had they shared that we might have been disappointed but we wouldn't have been po'd you know we really wouldn't have been terribly upset about it we would have figured out a way around it mm -hmm. uh, but you know um i don't know jeff if you want to share one of our one of our our best ones which was um you know camille and chen we had we had you know that's that, that right? yeah camille ray and chen yeah. Because I, yeah. I was going through one of them, and I was like, oh, look at Shen Shao Yi. But I wasn't entirely sure at first, um, <laughs> because on the penciling of them, mm -hmm. um, they look very similar, because it's very abstract. So yeah. it's like, is it, could it be Camille? And I was p wondering if that was Camille in Atlantis. And then I saw Woolsey write Shen. So please continue. Yeah. It, or it, say so that's, Shen. That's, we uh, we uh, knew that this was a concern, characters appearing on a show. And on on had, different parts of the franchise, too. yeah, and, and yeah, <clears throat> one, one show on another, and we came up with the idea that uh, Camille might have been Shen's protege. Uh -huh. They're both both women, both women of color, working in the federal government to the Department of Defense. It made sense that they might have found each other. And it's not that big uh, in some of those yeah. departments. Some of those departments right. are not that large. Pretty right. much everyone yeah. knows everybody and, in certain and, quarters. And, and yeah. you know, the IOC is a pretty IOA. Uh, tight, IOA, uh, tight, communi tight community. IOC yeah. does the Olympics. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I, 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 I think that it was logical. And, and there was a bit of fun for us because we're right, we're right in both books. 
and we wanted to add in character backstory that nobody had thought of. And I, and, and to this day, I think it was a great thing. So we knew that this was touchy. So we went to them and said, this is what we would like to do. This is before we even wrote the script for we Atlantis. Wrote, yeah. Okay. So what, it was for, was it Atlantis or universe book? Atlantis. I thought it was. Okay. Yeah, because because yeah. Camille is in the universe book. Yeah, so yeah. Camille's in the Atlantis. universe book. So we're having her communicating with Shen, mm-hmm. and we got the approval, and then we did it, and then we got unapproved, <laughs> and you know, well, the biggest like, the motivation. Heck? Yeah, the biggest motivation behind doing this is I had a writing mentor tell me one time um, that if you're a staff writer working on a TV show, and I think we touched on this when we were chatting at San Diego uh, last weekend, Mm -hmm. San Diego Comic-Con Special Edition, was that if you're a writer in the room, your job is to support the vision of the showrunner. You're, you're, You're to write episodes that the characters are and situations totally match what they have in mind. You know, you bring your own unique perspective to it as a writer, but ultimately it's supposed to fit within the context of a show created by another person. Yeah, you're servicing and that idea. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And what Jeff and I always did whenever we were writing these licensed comics, we would kind of take that on as our mindset when we were doing it. So that, you know, as a result, I mean, our comics in a lot of cases may not have been huge selling comic books but in their categories they they did quite well and the reviews were always like i can hear the characters speaking it sounds like in my head and and it feels like an episode of the show and so what we wanted to do was as closely as possible in comic books replicate the experience of watching an episode of stargate atlantis or stargate universe Um, and that meant these characters all inhabit the same fictional universe together so on the one side you have they all inhabit the same fictional universe together on the other side you have three different shows with multiple different deals with different actors and studios and liabilities and all these other kind of things so we understood the business reason and looking back you can only imagine like how did what were the legalities involved in having a, a different character from another show appear on you know one from SG one on Atlantis and Atlantis on SGU and vice versa, and it's like it seems like it was a lot easier for them to do it than it was for us. <laughs> well, I know for Atlantis, uh, the um, in terms of uh, control of, I- I'm missing I'm missing the legal term for it. What Rick had in terms mm-hmm. of for SG one like likeness rights. Right. Like, for yeah. instance, and all of the things that have to do with that, um, uh, there wasn't for Atlantis, were then returned to the actors for Universe. Like, all right. of them had that. So yeah. I wonder if that's something where um, uh, uh, Ming-Na, uh, mm-hmm. who didn't have a footing in Atlantis, did in, a, un- did in Universe with Camille Ray, and then something came about where they had to pull a lever or they strangely realized that enough, they didn't I, communicate with her. I can strangely enough answer that question. Okay. <laughs> Lou Diamond Phillips and Ming were the only people who didn't have likeness rights. Really? Okay. Yeah, and we got that from MGM. Oddly, okay. oddly, that was the case, you know, and, and um, what's interesting is that this goes back to even, we, we tend to pick up shows that have these situations like when we were doing the Battlestar Galactica comics based on the 1979 version, you think back and you're like, well, this was kind of a Star Wars analog for television. It's exactly what it was designed (laughs) from, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, Star Wars had that boatload of toys. And you think, oh my gosh, there's going to be this huge boatload of Battlestar Galactica toys coming. And you get some spaceships, you get some aliens, you get a Cylon figure, and then you get Commander Adama and Starbuck. Apollo's nowhere to be seen, uh, her, you know, Boomer's nowhere to be seen. And turns out that Lauren Green and Dirk Benedict, their likeness rights come with the license to the show. Richard Hatches did not. So we, we were only able to meet him later at a convention and say, can you write us a letter that says we can use your likeness rights? And he's like, can I write uh, an issue of the comic? And we agreed, but then he didn't end up sequence before we had to let the license go because yeah one of the things that uh, and he we were it was going to be a riff on his novel so it was not 
um, like a huge kind of new new thing. But we like to look at that. And it, the idea of the comic book kind of gave him a little bit of fuel um, because he was trying to get a new production launch there in the in the early 90s or late 90s early 2000s and we feel like that that's kind of what brought enough heat to it to get somebody like ron moore exactly right in, yeah richard you know. hatch was always had <laughs> he i mean he always had a love for that property yeah. and he revered uh, Ron Moore's version. He would get teary eyed when discussing it because it was yeah. such a big deal to him, you know. Yeah. And what an arc that character had over the course oh, yeah, of that Tom's series. Eric. Yeah, yeah. Man, was, oh man, uh, there was there was some stuff. I mean, <laughs> you know, I love I love them both actually, I, it, and I think they can coexist. Um, but it was it it would always be fun to go back and see you know what we would have done had Galactica arrived on Earth. We 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 had plots for stories that we never got to do. One of which was. Um, a battle star built by the, you know, we get to see this eventually in Stargate, but it's the idea of a battle star built by Earth, you know, and built it's by like, modern you know, humans, yeah, yeah, exactly. And you get Vipers with Air U.S. Air Force markings or whatever country had had built them, because at that point the Cylon threat is going to force this the countries of Earth to work together to defend mm -hmm. the planet, right? Um, and then, of course, flash forward to to Stargate. Uh, SG-1 in Atlantis, and then you get giant Earth-built starships utilizing alien technology. I think is it is it, it is my hope that the next uh, uh, Stargate, if it continues continuity with Wright and Cooper and those guys, you mm -hmm. know, our technology has advanced to the point where you have to ask yourself, what what do we do next? And I think the thing yeah. that we do next is that we make our own Stargates. Yeah, like I would love yeah. to see a a, hum, a a U.S. Air Force built Stargate. Yeah, um, absolutely. And just use using the same points in space, but, but I, it only works with a Verizon system. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is Verizon it running five G? Fine with that, by the way. That's good. <laughs> yeah. You didn't pay the cable bill. You had a <laughs> what are funny. you talking about? Well, have Verizon manufacture it. Have them be That's like right. a co have them be like a sponsor on the show. <laughs> well, they were going. I mean, they were definitely going in that direction. With Dell, with, some, yeah. with, uh, with some of the Atlantis storylines with uh, the nanites and and stuff like that. With the Stargate, the, that? the Stargate only works with your Fitbit. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> Apple Watch. No, no, I'm just kidding. I have an Apple Watch, so I'm not slamming Apple at all. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Atlantis. Uh, yeah. Season six, the the back to Pegasus mm -hmm. arc that you guys did. What were you wanting to do with that? What did you achieve? What did you not get a chance to do? The, the, Jeff, if you could, if you could start us off. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll start with that in backwards order. The stuff we didn't get to do was more issues than we did. Um, the approval process was really slow. Um, uh, some of the artists before Gordon Purcell um, uh, were uh, be, they were put through a lot of changes mm -hmm. and and some of them understandably, some of them not. Uh, and that really slowed down the process. Gordon uh, is a super professional uh, guy used to working with licensed titles, of course, a vast experience with Star Trek. Uh, and he really delivered not only what we put on the paper, uh, but on a timely basis. Um, so the ability to do more, and I also, fr quite frankly, the, the turnaround time on the approvals was, uh, was abysmal. Um, that said, uh, what we got to do, first thing, there, Atlantis being on earth is just like, well, it's just a dumb, dumb, dumb thing if you're gonna leave it there uh, in terms of like, then it's just SG-1. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're just leaving from earth and going and doing things, and you've got this secret floating thing that you don't want people to discover. That's your novelty. You know, the adventure is out there in Pegasus. There's too many, there's too much, there's too much in Atlantis that's wonderful and uh, needed to be redone. So we got that pretty quickly. And um, Mark had come up with a year, I mean, I don't know, Mark, years before we ever did the comic. Uh, come up with a concept that we were able to drop into this, which uh, which, gate, which gate hub. Oh yeah, we had uh, 
Um, you know, I'll just say when Jeff was referring to approvals, primarily it was MGM studio approval, consumer licensing approvals, which were just, it was, it was very hard to predict. And to just clarify a little bit for the artists that we had early on in the, in the run of the book, um, the constantly going back to an artist with those types of changes, even when they're drawing from an approved script without stepping out of the licensed mm -hmm. comic thing for a while, you know, because nobody's making an incredible amount of money, you've got to get the, the fulfillment of a project comes from seeing a creative vision come to life. And so when we're writing, we write, we write specifically in certain instances to make sure it gets approved. Um, but, you know, the artist is generally free to bring whatever they want angles. They're, they're kind of the director of photography, you know, if we're, if we're, the writers, producers, and that type of Correct. thing. Correct. They, they light and, and yeah, do a whole exactly. scene. Yeah. And so when they get a lot of, no, this has to be this way, this has to be this way, and they're going back and doing a lot of changes, you know, the meter's running for the publisher, who's already on a thin margin. So it was hard to to keep a an artist for the run of the book, you know, which is always important when you go to collect it, you're flipping through it. And when the art style changes as drastically as it did through the course of the book, it can be disconcerting, you know, to a reader as well as ourselves. And in some cases, the, you know, what we were dealing with early on in the book was artists who would not draw things that, you know, granted, they have their the freedom to do what they want in a lot of cases. But in some cases where we specify something, it's a plot point that didn't get drawn. It's sometimes there's spots, spots where it's not going to make sense. So that was a little bit of the frustration early on in terms of saying something that we got to do that we didn't want to do. <laughs> it's just a flip your question a little bit. But one of the things that we did get to do was this idea of multiple gate systems, you know, between, and it's kind of like a version of the, of the intergalactic gate bridge. And what we did was think that at some point, the ancients that developed the Stargate would have had a, an easier way to get from system to system you know, go from one gate system to the other. So we we kind of came up with this idea that somewhere lurking out in our Milky Way galaxy, or even at some point between galaxies, there is a version of the intergalactic gate bridge that Rodney and Carter developed, um, but connects instead of just two gate systems up to six gate systems. Wow. So, so, you know, so the idea was that, um, we, it, basically what we're trying to do is find ways to open up the story a little mm -hmm. bit. Other going. galaxies. Yeah, exactly. Other galaxies and also uh, a, can, a like a parallel system within our galaxy that may go to different planets than the main system does. Basically a, a local system. Yeah. You like know, if, you, if, you're, if your regular Stargate is the Express, here's one, here's one that goes from this station to a, another gate that's near this near Earth that we didn't know about before. The, the idea the idea was that uh, the gate system because they always use the analogy of telephone you know telephones mm -hmm. analogy that this would be like an extension in an office phone system so it's like I want to go from this planet in the, in this in the same star system to another moon or another planet in the same system and you know I don't have a ship ships are expensive to run whether you the ancients developed them or not you know there's still a cost to it and yeah, there's resources. still a time factor yeah so why wouldn't you develop a short range Stargate that would let you get to the moon and back instantly, you know? And so uh, we just were trying to play with different takes on the technology and see what we could uh, come up with. And again, all for the purpose of going beyond this, these stories that each kind of had a specific purpose, which primarily for the first one was to get Pegasus off earth and back to, or get Atlantis off earth and back to the Pegasus galaxy. Okay. And this wasn't fully, the, the, so did you hint at this in the earlier in the in the comics that that are out uh yeah okay. yeah they, they, it didn't it, the, the basically the way we had visualized it in the script was if you think of an airport terminal with yeah. gates going down both sides uh your doors to the planes this would have been stargates going down Got both it. sides and uh, it was drawn quite a bit differently than we had we had anticipated. Oh, I understand. So the, the, the full effect is not there. <laughs> you know, that's that's the thing. It, when I have never been an enormous comics connoisseur, um, mm -hmm. but it's one of the things that I, I imagine that everyone looks at from from page to page to page uh, when you're consuming this this medium. 
mm-hmm. especially when you're following characters that from actors that you know. Every yep. time you turn the page, you're going to go, ooh, that's a really good rendering of that person. That brings me more into this universe. And then you turn yeah. the page, ooh, that doesn't really like <laughs> look like them so much. This brings me out. Yes. You know, yes. I and is is that normal? <laughs> what it's what it's the constant. Oh, sorry, Jeff. Go I ahead, was just going to say for me, uh, and I'm a I'm a lifelong co- comics guy. Yeah. What I can tell you is that for me, it and I and I view this as my personal and my professional opinion too. Consistency matters more than degree of likeness. Oh, that's a fair point. If you come in to page one and your Princess Leia on page one, page three, page seven, page nine, all look like the same character, you stand a lot better chance of not jacking with your fan and bursting them out of the moment than you do if you have this one, like you just described, spot on likeness on page one. And then page three, you're like, is that the same character? <laughs> yeah, you're literally pausing to make that determination. Yeah. And 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 it's it's a credit to the artist, as we mentioned, like Gordon Purcell, who was just innately able to do that, where the, the page layouts will be done in such a way that you have, you know, kind of these key visuals spaced evenly. And so that the skip, because, you know, you're good, it's going to be hard pressed to do a, an accurate rendering when in some cases the person's head on the page might be an inch tall versus an eighth of an inch, you know, depending. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that ties into in addition to likenesses as uh, were specifically related to the Stargate franchise was the concepts of canon and accuracy for uniforms and mm. the technology and things. Because one of the things that we had looked at from since the show was originally on that, you know, how come there isn't more Stargate stuff, you know, and one of those, one of the things that that happened, and, and I think one of the reasons that um, the fan base, aside from the, the story of the characters, is the, uh, why fans are so faithful to the show and so kind of, um, you know, put in, turn a critical eye towards licensed products, especially ones that are visual in nature, is that the universe that the, that the creators of that show built from the art department through the producers was so consistent, you know, and it really, it built a world that you like to be in and you want to be in. And when you saw something that was, that was a mistake or wasn't quite right, um, you know, it, it can bounce you out of what you're supposed to be paying attention to. And so there was a large portion of the time where we were kind of sending corrections to uniforms and various mm-hmm. other things back to uh, our artists and saying, look, we're not, we're not doing this to, to create a problem for you or to be difficult in any way. But this is, we want to make sure the book has a shot and people have a chance to get into the story and reacquaint themselves with the characters and, and feel like they're watching an episode again. And this type of thing, like, you know, missing patches on the sleeves, you know, or the wrong patch on yeah, a sleeve. Yeah, it's pretty unacceptable. Uniform. It, to, to, to this Stargate fan base, it is. And, and being fans, we kind of felt like we were going to our publisher and our artists and saying, this is a potential problem. We should fix this because we don't need to, you know, the term in football, I think, is or sports is an unforced error. You know, it's like we don't, we, if we can see this mistake, we should correct it. One, of, one of the things. So that's why Jeff, things- Jeff's called, Jeff called me the, the canon guru. And I was like, I'm sure that the people that I was calling and emailing had other names for me. <laughs> But the, but the basic but the basic thing the basic thing is that Mark and I have both been fans in the in this same role. We've both been fans and had uh, the the bad experience of you spend money on something and unfortunately get bounced out really quickly. Mm-hmm. And not only do you not continue with that series, uh, you you know it taints your it taints your it stands the possibility of taming your fandom of the thing that inspired it. If they're going to, if they're going to allow stuff like that, um, Mark came across one very early on in a novel. Well, it was, uh, yeah, you, David, you might know about this. It's one of the early before Fandemonium who has the novel license. There was the SG one novels. There were like two or three. I've heard of them, but I've not read them. Oh, I well, I did. I didn't read much of one because they identified uh, Carter as Amanda Carter. 
Oh and God! Margaret, and it's like that made it through the writer, the editor, MGM, and was published and distributed that way. And you're kind of like, Fah! you know, you just like want to throw it away. Yeah, <laughs> you know, no, you, like what is this? It's not yeah, taking itself even... seriously. Why should I? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But, and that's the level of fans that we are, which you know, we we want to. We knew what fans would want. I think in this particular one of, instance, one of the because it's that, what we wanted to see. <laughs> one of the things that we we went from that experience and and Galactica uh, into 24 with was, you know, we've got this idea that if you, okay, if you can't hear Jack Bauer, I mean, Jack Bauer, come on. If you right. can't hear Jack Bauer's voice in your head, you need to not be writing that comic. Yeah. You have no business doing it. And, yeah. and we got accidentally copied on a, a message from Fox to uh, uh, our publisher, IDW. And uh, Jeff Marriott was our ed initial editor. He's the guy we did the pitch with, and he's the guy that edited our first project. And uh, it was uh, the, the I, what was it called there? Consumer products? What was it called? At yeah, I think it was. Yeah, Fox and, consumer and products. Their, their guy, their, their people were saying, your guys nailed it. And that was that and was the only note they wanted. had on the script, you know, which that's was what, That was literally the note. And that's, and, and to me, listen, Mark said this before, um, and to put a little more uh, oomph on it, everything, every time that we spend writing Stargate is something we're not spend spending writing something we're going to own. Uh -huh. You know, Mark is, a, Mark is, Mark is a creator in his own right. I'm a creator in my own right. And we've done stuff together. You mentioned our, the, the show we're working on with Roddenberry and, uh, and so we have to love this stuff to go to go through this uh, because even writing other comics that didn't have that approval process would be a faster process and it's therefore stand the chance of making more money. Uh, so there really is a genuine amount of love that goes into this stuff. And, you know, you've obviously got the same thing. We can sit around talking Stargate. The show hasn't been on in a gazillion years. And yet here we are. We still love it. Yeah. Fall right, right? back into it. No. And I've. And I've Go ahead. And I and I, I just think that the thing that uh, if you're going to take on a project, you have to act like it's canon, even if it's not. Uh -huh. right. Why take that? Why do that thing that breaks your fellow fan out of it if you love it so much? Yeah. And, and we do. And we do respect the idea that canon is going to be something that's on film by the people who own the show you know and and hopefully as as we were talking a minute ago knock wood that any new shows we get will have the participation of of at least some of the creative team that brought us such a wonderful group of series you know before um and you know if they happen to see something in the comic they really like you know just absolutely like, give us a call <laughs> So one of the things that uh, was brought up here, if I can find the the, the question, okay, Dan Ben, uh, what what did you what uh, introductions were made to the Stargate comics that you're particularly proud of? Any any new ships? Any new technology? I think the, probably our biggest one was the was the Gate Hub that we talked okay. about, which connected multiple systems and. You know, this the technology wise, it's something we wanted to see as fans and story wise, we wanted to give ourselves an opportunity uh, to come up with a new, um, you know, new ways to take the story in the that's, middle. Uh, that's, I, abs I absolutely agree with the, the, the gate hub. And it is something we would have gone back to in mm. installments if we were not if we were able to and had more issues that we could have done. Um, the other thing that I think we did is a, as, a, as, a, as a bit of a convention was if you look at how we started, we started with previously on Stargate Atlantis. Correct. <laughs> we, and that's a good point. I, John. I do that. In, I do that in my own comics. Yeah. Previously in Vampire PA. And I hit three pages of flashbacks. You want to bring and, people up to speed? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's one of the things that we were talking about is that. Uh, you know, the continuity <laughs> of all three shows is so tightly wound that it makes it that much more real of an experience. Like you could remember these things as if you were there with the team experiencing them because there are very few gaps in what we see. And when you can tune into a show in season eight, nine or 10 
and you get a clip in the previously on Stargate SG-1 section that goes back to season two, you know, that's crazy. Like in terms of television, like and, they don't and, expect I, people I, to have memories. I, I, that I absolutely agree with that. That's one of the things and that Mark, Mark love that about Stargate. <laughs> we love that about, about Stargate and, and truthfully jump, jump shows here for a minute. Um, the episode of Discovery where it said previously on Star Trek and they meant Star Trek. Correct. Yeah. You know, that was the original I, series. I was, I was like, I'll admit I was, I was, I was here in my apartment and the only person that saw me go, what was my cat? So, <laughs> but that was a and, great callback and, because yeah. I mean, it goes back to the core of, of the franchise is the cage. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I, sorry, oh, go ahead, I, I just wanted to get back to Dan's question real quick was the, the, oh, that. In, in universe. I love Dan because he asked us a nice question. I love it. Um, was, you know, we can't do a spoiler, but there was some stuff. And we don't want to do a spoiler if people haven't read Stargate Universe. But there there was some cool stuff in there. And, and what overall, what we tried to do was kind of eliminate some, wrap up some storylines, rather, mm. that we felt like, okay, being on the edge of catastrophe, maybe let's, with the ship nearly falling apart, let's figure out a way that that's not the case anymore. Because towards the end of the series, and you know, I talked to a fair amount of fans online and at various conventions over the years, and there were a lot of people who did not hang with SGU to the point at which it was really starting to get turn good. back. To, yeah, it turned back. It, it get good is the quick way to say it. At the end, where it was turning back to what we were more familiar with, but it was a great mix of those mm -hmm. things. And what we wanted to try to do again with the hope of doing more was like, okay, they're leaning into the mission now. It's like, we still would like to get home, but that's not our, our primary overriding concern anymore. You know, and, and um, it was, we would, we wanted to explore that. So what we did in that comic is we introduced some new characters, uh, which you're like, how do you introduce new characters in that particular situation? And I'd say the comic is on Comixology if you want to, if you want to find it. Um, but that's something we were, we were really kind of happy and, and it was fun to do. And honestly, it's one of those things that we were surprised they let us do. Really? You know? Yeah, because yeah. we, we sent the proposal and we're just like, we, <laughs> we had been doing Atlantis long enough at that point where when we did the proposal for Universe, it's like, let's just send it. We're and one of the things, saying, no, we know what of, that's like. So. Yeah, to back, to back that up. <laughs> One of the things that happened was they went through a year, a year of likeness stuff with artists. Different sketch. You On know, they, did, they did uh, model sheets for anybody who's familiar yeah. with animation where you do a lot of different angles. And Turnarounds. Expressions and, yeah. Yeah. You know. And, and, um, and we got one guy who was just phenomenal stylized but uh, really phenomenal i've seen his other comic work too and um he ended up staying an issue after going through like six months of approval nightmares um wow. uh and that was really it was listen we recovered well and the story and truthfully our story uh, okay i don't want this to sound as egotistical as it's going to but there's no way around it. our story's strong enough that it survived the artist transitions mm -hmm. There's no um, way to make that sound good. <laughs> I, there isn't. There isn't. But I'm a I'm a fan, and I love that. I've had jaded jaded comic book retailers tell me that that our books were the only books they were reading because they were also Star Stargate fans. And it's tonally and, Stargate. I and, in rereading them for this interview. I and, mean, it's and, the, the tone is is what you have to have. If you yeah, have nothing I, else, I, it's like I, this feels right, and it does feel. I, right. I have, uh, Thanks, man. I really appreciate you saying that. And Mark and I worked really hard and, you know, it's, you take episodes, you take series that you love and you go back and rewatch them and rewatch them and rewatch them for details. And you're looking at it different than you're looking at it as a fan. Mm -hmm. And you stand the chance of getting, you stand the chance of getting burned out on it because you're watching some of the stuff so frequently. Right. Um, and we were willing to take that risk because, because we loved it. Mm -hmm. And, when we got to the point where like we we just we had been watching these other people jumping through hoops on SGU, we've been going through on SGA. And it was like finally Mark says, let's just send it. <laughs> you know, how how much can they how much can they say no? Yeah. No, it's just a no. It's already no because they haven't and seen it. And it sailed through. Yeah. They were like, it's fine. 
And we were like, really? And that was and that was part of the inconsistency was how fast they did. I think they had it for like three days. Yeah. You never know. (laughs) Catch somebody on a good day, right? right? Yeah, exactly. It's like maybe that person had like a, you know, just got to there was no traffic that morning and they got, you know, something to slid right in. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I think in both case, in both cases, uh, you know, SGA and SGU. Uh, I really feel like we we added something. The things in SGA uh, on the surface are a little more esoteric. They're situational, getting it back to Pegasus, right? Um, uh, continuing some adventures, keeping things in character, uh, uh, adding the gate hub, which I think I really, in, in all seriousness, for anybody else that writes for these, because we do not own it, anybody else that writes for these, that's they can go out and take that and 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 so we maybe we've added something to the mythos of all three yeah and um, mgm owns that stuff once you turn mm-hmm. it in and it's published they it's theirs they can do what they and, want with it and, at that point. and so we look at it like like that though if they're the smart characters, <laughs> the characters the characters we added to uh sgu um uh, there's some there's and the situational change that we provided um uh, could somebody could really run with that and we'd love it to be us do you want to provide a hint to what that is in the SGU comics? I want people to to go out and grab them. Okay. Well, um, Jeff, you like punch this punch your camera if I'm if I'm saying too much. But the the idea is that uh, where we last leave Eli is kind of he's on the observation deck looking out, kind of wondering. He's the only person still awake. They've they've kind of cut ties with Earth. Earth is not expecting to hear from them for three years while they cross an intergalactic void. And he still has to fix his hibernation pod. Um, and so we have we pick up with him trying to figure out how to do that and really running into quite a few problems um, until he gets an idea that says, all right, a ship this big with a potentially with a crew this big is going to have more than 100 of these pods or however many they had. You know, to be one short, there should be another one somewhere. So he's try he looks it up, finds another bank of them somewhere else in the ship. And once he gets there, he makes a discovery that uh, there are already people in them. And where those people have been come there from, all along. And they've been there the entire time. And so when he remotely reactivates that bank of equipment so that there's life support, when he gets there, they're already out and wondering what the heck's going on. And that, of course, sends us off on our adventure. Right. And uh, they may or may not be part of the ship's original crew who figured out how to keep themselves alive in hibernation. For that long. Um, for that long, yeah. Yeah, because exactly. you, you do continue to age. It's just extremely yes. slowly. So. Which, which that is funny you mentioned that episode. We, we were, that was something that we talked about. It's like, this is kind of a crazy idea. But we gave those characters the background and knowledge to be able to figure it out. Got it. You know, in some way. And um, so, uh, you know, that sends them off in an adventure the, within the ship. You know, that's the, so they, well, and then we actually also touch base on um, the, uh, the planet where CJ left her baby. Correct. You know, so we come back to that a little bit. Those, that, that mystery reasserts itself as something that we were going to explore, uh, you know, in further issues. It was the yeah, obelisk yeah, planet. The, yes. The, the real, the real unfortunate, the real unfortunate thing about the, the, the timing is if you, if you look at the, the span of American mythology's license and I got to say, you know, Jim, uh, Corrick, uh, in American deserves mythology, the medal. <laughs> he, he, he treated us uh, like, what do you guys want to do? Mm, you know, yeah. he gave us a bunch of things at first. We bounced around on them and then we were off to the races and we never got zero blowback from them on anything we wanted to do. Uh, there, the, the thing that I think uh, about it that was the most unfortunate was we produced four, f- four stories, four three issue arcs for Atlantis. And we got half of that for SGU and literally the first six issues, which is one arc for that book. The first six issues were just setting up what we wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. you're, you're left with what Brad was left with, with University. <laughs> very well, we, similar we situation. Joked about that af- we joked about that afterward. <laughs> Way afterward. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> but it was it was so much fun to do that that you know and, and as as you said it's like we love the franchise so much that it's the thing that we will you know our, if our other business partners and and uh, um contributors and collaborators aren't listening to it's like we, we will drop stuff to do some stargate things or we'll delay other things because it's you know in the past license the best one of the best things that licensed products do especially as um in it's in the in between time when there's film right content you know it kind of keeps everybody right. you're drip feeding a little bit of uh you know the hardcore fans that are staying in there so and you will so you want to do right by them you know, and have give them some entertainment and and hope for the future. You know, which is, I think, the thing that you know, even even if you didn't see it in the universe at the beginning, they got there. Correct. You know, all of those sh- all of those shows have that. Yeah, I'm always <laughs> amazed at the number of people who come up to me at, uh, at events and say, uh, or I've had conversations with at events who are like, you know, what I didn't watch Universe when it aired. I've watched it since, and I get it now. And I, you and know, what? Sorry, what's... I didn't keep with it. <laughs> What's really funny about it, and I mean, and, and it really is the, the sad part of this for for me is, I keep that, trying to end on a good note, Jeff. You keep I going know. to something sad or unfortunate. <laughs> well, any more notes to come? Way, let me say this. <laughs> I'm teasing. This. I'm totally teasing. Sorry. No, I I agree. I agree, and it's funny because I'm usually the upbeat one. I'm usually the, you know, hey, let's just get a smaller glass, then it'll be full. Um, <laughs> but he's actually said that in meetings. It works. But. but <laughs> SGU was American mythology's best-selling comic book. Yeah. And they uh, sold out of the trades so quickly. Um, one of the reasons, one of the reasons that we'd like them to get the license again is because they could they could go back to press with that first trade right now and it would sell. Yeah. And it is something that when Mark and I have them at conventions, they fly. Yeah. And and that's even with the con- inconsistency between the artists. There's, by the way, there's nothing wrong with any of the artists on that book. Right. It's just it's chapter to chapter. It's different. Different artists. Yeah. Uh, and the last three are the same, which which really helps. Um, but in all seriousness, uh, it's a it's a great story. And it just there, there is that frustration of if we even had done six more issues. Like Atlantis, I think you can read our story arcs on Atlantis and say, I feel like I just saw two really great two hour movies. Hmm. That's what we that's what we were going for. Anyway, that feeling of, you know, having seen it. I mean, we we really wanted to do um, you know, the 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 film that they had wrote, written for the the DVD. Extinction, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, we we were we wanted to do that kind of as a separate project, but again, yeah, and it, you actually start getting into like writers' guild rules and mm-hmm. payments for the original authors, and it you know it, it wrecks the math on being able to do it as a comic book. Um, but you know, we wanted to do that. We wanted to do our series and then have an additional. Yeah, well, they, did the, they did have the they did have the rights to do Icarus, but that uh, uh, which you know the prequel for SGU, mm-hmm. right? But it was but again, it was totally into the the, the time delay on the approvals um that made it not not possible I mean, we had the, we had the goal of having a year's worth of our stuff not half a year's worth of our stuff out before that got done wow that's quite a time delay it yeah. was weird yeah it was and and, and i think really? the, part, well, the hard one. part was wasn't it um tracking down the actors and going to their representatives because they everything was through their there their was rent. listen they got they, they there was a bit of that at first absolutely that took time but then the real thing was the 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 artists that were fed through the process before they got to Giancarlo um it just ate them up and spit them out and some of the and some of their work was very was very passable but um some of it was excellent you were like I mean I'll have to I'll have to send it to you after the fact David maybe you can find a place to to show it as no as, absolutely but, yeah. I found some of the original sketches of the characters and you're like, wow, this there's, you know, you look at it as a comic book person. You're like, this is amazing. And there's absolutely no way they'd be able to do that on a monthly basis. <laughs> no, I'm, I am all for the, what would have been. Yeah. And the, and the other thing, the other thing for along those lines is back to the, the thing that I said earlier, it, consistency is more important than being dead mm-hmm. on. I, 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 as a, as a guy who's spent his entire 
fandom life in comics and as a guy who was a professional for 28 years it 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 matters way more than being dead on on likenesses but tell that to an actor who this may be their one shot at getting a likeness approval you know I, I, I there's nobody it's not in this case it's not like anybody's pulling for the wrong side it's just that some of the some of the actors they may be you know they may be looking at you know this is their one big role they, damn it i'm gonna look like me sure Absolutely. Speaking of that, an interesting comment here from uh, someone in the chat by the name of Spectacular. I supported the initial SGA comic Kickstarter, and my likeness is actually in one of the issues as a background character. I am oh, forever awesome. a part of Stargate. Yeah. <laughs> that was our. It was our version. We were. We were like our version of that get in the gate thing with sci-fi. Yes. For a couple of years, we were like, let's do that. <laughs> we yeah. really listen. Uh, MGM and a lot of companies. To be fair to MGM. They 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 view doing Kickstarters and crowdfunding in general as diminishing their property. For me, I view it as doesn't that mean that your property has a lot of very faithful adherents? Mm. Why wouldn't why wouldn't you do that? But they listen. They've got their own agendas, and they're not bad for doing so. Mm-hmm. But that was the only one we were able to do, and that was such a freaking great idea. Who who wouldn't want to get into a Stargate comic? Come on. I agree. We didn't, get, we didn't get drawn into it. We were trying to. <laughs> <laughs> it would we have never occurred to me to ask. Stuff. Like, yeah, that, that would have been a yeah, really exactly. reasonable. Mar- so. Mark, along those lines, I'm now in Fright Night number one. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> one of the artists, one of the artists, there's a there's a scene um, where there's a, a, a battle sequence in the Stargate Atlantis comic. And one of the F-302s mm. is destroyed. And he's like, that that was you. That was you right there. You know, you can't see anything. <laughs> I said, thanks, thanks it was a supposed lot. to be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, Brad Wright blows up uh, in the air support in Stargate Continuum. So, oh yeah, that's right. Know? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I still love his turn as Scotty. In, uh, oh, in absolutely, and that's yeah. only because Paul McGillian wasn't available. Oh, really? Okay. I didn't know that. That's that would that's, have been that's, hysterical. That's, that's really great. I uh, <laughs> in in twenty four, we killed a lot of a lot of our friends. Um, <laughs> I, I had an artist, an artist that Mark and I have known for a long time, and I've worked with a lot, named Gene Gonzalez, call me out of the blue one day and say, "Hey, am I your friend?" I'm like, "Yeah, we're friends. We've been friends for 14 years. What are you talking about?" He goes, "How come you never killed me in a comic?" Yeah, <laughs> there are people asking for it. <laughs> and 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 I said, "Well, I could do that." He goes, "It can't be any of this saving the platoon crap. It's got to be senseless." <laughs> and, and I said, like, how Jeff, do you feel about being you know, like on the spot? I said, how do you feel about being mauled by a pack of zombie chihuahuas? <laughs> and he had his wife shoot reference photos of him running afraid. <laughs> and, and I used it in my comic zombies, the zombie proof. Uh, I have a friend who was killed in one of the, in a Marvel comic. Vactor's down. It says Vactor's down. I think his likeness yeah. is in there too. It's like, that's a great way oh, of getting great. immortalized. So uh, KPPK wants to know uh, what species or weapons did you, did you bring in that you were big fans of? I was thrilled that you brought the gray aliens back. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was our shorthand for that was DV that that else variation. We called them DV aliens. We tried to come up with a name and never could come up with anything. And we added, we added a different cast to them, a slightly more intelligent leader kind of, uh, or group leader kind of cast. Like a necromancer. Uh, a little bit, and, yeah. Okay. And I think he looked like a necromancer too. And he did, and <laughs> and that was a that was a lot of fun. Uh, we, and we also jacked with some of the technology because of that, you know, mm-hmm. in, in a very Stargate way, uh, with how they were able to access things. And we, you know, and that with part of our, you know, with our storyline involving the character of Janice, uh, pretty heavily for that, which we did, you know, kind of love that idea and. Um, he's a brilliant you know, character a, to mine. We yeah. Took some crap for that. Yeah. So great. And, um, that we thought, well, that, you know, in Daedalus variations, they're going to different versions of their reality. Mm-hmm. Uh, there will be a different version of him. He will have come up with different inventions. And so in that particular universe where they land and encounter those aliens, well, that was, that was their attempt to de- for the Atlanteans to develop a, um, a vicious opponent for the wraith that would basically protect them. And so that was kind of our, we tried to work that logic backwards and say, okay, 
it was not replicators. It's it's these guys, you mm-hmm. know. This time. So yeah, they didn't um, make replicators in that reality. They made something else. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's really legit. <laughs> yeah, just give Janice like a a, a beard, you yeah. know, a goatee. <laughs> So there's at um, least there's at least one panel where I think he's drawn with one and he shouldn't have been. But, <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> so, but I'll, with, that's what we go with it. It's the, the way the, you know, what's the thing in show business? If the audience doesn't notice, that's exactly how it was supposed to go. Yeah. <laughs> Tracy wanted to know, can you guys talk at all about the writing process and how it translates into the art? JC. Sure. Away. One of the one of the, I mentioned earlier, one of the, one of the fun things about this because Mark and I have known each other for so long, is it, we tend to be very heavy on the plotting part of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll go back and forth, and we'll, we we don't usually get to a script until. And it doesn't mean we don't spot errors once we're scripting, but we don't usually go to a script until we are comfortable that we've got the plot, um, and that's because we both can write pretty fast once we know once we know where we're going Mm -hmm. and uh i i also think that if you look at our individual story arcs and sga gives us a more of an example here because we only had the one arc in universe i don't think we wrote the same way twice in in in, inside of four arcs plus go back to 24 i don't think uh, i think you know sometimes it's sometimes we do the like all of the plot together uh, there's been times where Mark had more of the plot than I had, um, and maybe I ended up dialoguing. Uh, I, you know, and, stuff like that. And then in the end, it's always our product because we're both always going through and saying, "No, this is wrong. Got to do this. We got to do this." When we go back through, Mark, you want to expand on? Well, yeah. That? Well, no, I was just going to say, and how that ends up translating to the artwork portion of it is that we we usually know who our artist is going to be ahead of time so we'll you know mm. jump on the phone when we're getting started we'll have a lot of art notes if you've ever if you ever have the chance to if we're set up at a show or we're at a, a convention we'll, we'll sometimes have copies of our scripts available because people find it interesting to look at and and frankly we're running out of comic books so we want to have something yeah for something people, for them you know and so um uh what we do is we generally will talk to that artist, you know, ahead of time and say, look, we're going to, we'd like to leave this up to you as much as possible, but where we do, and I mentioned this earlier, where we do need something specific that's related to the plot, please make sure this is prominent and, and things like that. And then because we are uh, fans of the detail that the Stargate franchise is known for, um, we will produce a, like a Google drive, just full of reference photos and down to the down to the page and panel numbers that like, this is the weapon that he should have in his hand. This is the uniform. This is the way the uniform should look. He's you know, left-handed, with, blah, blah, with blah. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't, and it's just so that, because again, it's like when you see those things and there's, you know, having watched the show enough, you can go back now. And it's like, when you see a uniform error, like somebody's wearing the wrong rank insignia or the wrong patch or some such thing, it's it, loud. you just see it. Yeah. It's loud, <laughs> exactly. I mean, we, you know, you let it go by because you're 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 into the story at that point, but you notice it. You bump up against it, is the the phrase. So we we would work very closely with the artists to make sure that they're being able to bring some of their stuff in. And at one point, we had an artist who was like really great at the technology, but not so much at the likenesses, you know. And and then we had one that was the reverse, you know, he was nailing the likenesses, but it's like. This is supposed to be a room full of ZPMs, and it, it looks like a, you know the garden section at Home Depot. It's like no, that's not <laughs> that's, that's not, not what it's yeah. supposed to be, right? <laughs> yeah, we had we had we had we, same artist that Mark was talking about just there, um, really phenomenal artist, but didn't like all the detail stuff. I'm like, well, probably not the comic for you, right? Right. right? But we had a scene where um, Walter and Chuck from SGA Uh go through the gate. They go on a little side adventure. And um, they end up on this planet with this ancient looking gate. And it's a jungle planet with weird creatures. And I I literally, we came up with that because we knew this guy was gonna be the artist. Uh, Ah, okay, you wrote to his forte. Yes, yeah, the exactly. Look great, and, and that, and 
and there's there's a couple of flat out brilliant pages in that. Wow. And it's that's that little storyline. We when we <laughs> kind of pitched that, that's one of those other things that we didn't think we would get in. But there's a, a basically a glitch in the gate where um, Walter and Chuck are going through. Uh, you know, Chuck has to go back to Earth for a specific reason. And you know, it's funny because the relationship between uh, the characters is uh, Gary Jones, who plays Walter Harriman on the show, knows the actor that played Chuck, the op his opposite number on Atlantis. And so when he was reading these scenes, he was sending us messages. He's like, this is great. I know this guy. I know this actor in, in, per you know, in real life. So we should you know, figure out something to do with that. His and, name and was he, Chuck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so the, you know, it's two guys that aren't trained for field duty. They're not necessarily scientists. They're smart, technical guys, uh -huh. you know, and, um, and they're, and they're, course, they're basically, yeah. they're basically trapped on a planet that's moon is about to uh, crash into it and be ripped apart by gravity. <laughs> and and um, they have to figure out and, how to, and there's no, and there's it. no DHD. Right. <laughs> So, we'll just give them a, you know, give them a toolkit and a shot at yeah, fixing and, the gate. And what and was a chance? <laughs> what was what was fun was when uh, American Mythology uh, uh, Mark had a couple of projects taking off. So uh, I sort of solo wrote off of our plot um, what was supposed to be three parts. Uh, and they they had a thing called okay, the, I believe the full title was Stargate Atlantis Stargate Universe Anthology. And there was one one shot and then three three issues of what we call ongoing. Um, and I mapped out three issues, grabbing some of the existing art and MGM bristled at that. And it was just, you know, just <laughs> so it ended up being one part. But we there actually is an eight page story of of Walter and Chuck on this planet. Got, as the one shot. Yeah. Got it. Uh, yeah, as part of that, yeah. There was someone. Let me see here where it went. Yeah. It might uh, be eight pages. Might be sixteen pages. I can't remember. Akos uh, wanted to know: is is it more ch challenging to write the to come up with the the shorter uh, comics or the longer ones? Do you feel what's more organic, in your personal opinions? I think you know if I would. For us, it's it's when we came up with the story. Um, it, it was actually probably a little bit easier because we knew we had 12 issues of Atlantis to do a story in. So in that particular instance, we kind of worked backwards and we, we said, okay, where do we want to end up at the end of the story? And it was, you know, Pegasus or Atlantis is back in Pegasus. And, um, you know, the, we've, we've found a replacement for the chair on earth. You know, and, and certain other things that we wanted to have happen because, again, all of it was because both of those shows were canceled abruptly. And mm -hmm. this was, you know, our comics were coming in to provide both the 12 issue series for Atlantis and the six issue series for Universe. Their ultimate goal was to provide a jumping off point to start doing stories again with the idea that those comics would continue until there's a new show. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and so... Yeah. Um, we, uh, um, so that was kind of what we did in that case. So I think the, where it got, where it got challenging and Jeff is very good at explaining this. I'll just intro it very briefly is the differences. Cause my, my writing experience is more geared towards film and television. You know, okay. I've written, I've written comics, but as Jeff will tell you, and it's his best example is you cannot write, you know, Shepard enters and crosses to the console in a single panel. Yeah, you know, so Jeff, I'll let you pick that up and, and talk yeah, the, ori the more original about example the was adapting. <laughs> the original example was Jack Bauer enters the room, picks up a gun, turns and smiles. That can't be panel one. Yeah, <laughs> right. And 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 it, but but here's my one comic book name drop for this conversation. Uh, I was having a conversation with Will Eisner, the creator of the Spirit and the father of the modern graphic novel, and. I asked him because his spirit stories were seven and eight pages. And, and I said, what's, what's easier, shorter or longer? And he says, somebody who can write a short story can always write a longer story. The opposite isn't necessarily true. Some people can't be concise enough right. to do that. 
Uh, I will say that most of the, the shorter uh, SGA and SGU pieces are much more along the lines of vignettes than, than stories with beginning, middles, and ends of consequence. Doesn't mean exclusively that's true, but that, that was uh, American mythology's approach. And I, you know, I was fine with that. Um, that said, Mark and I were always working um, to make this the experience we wanted as, as fans. And so I think I mentioned earlier that we treated each of our trade paperbacks reads like a really freaking good two hour movie. And I, I think we achieved that. I really do think we achieved that uh, with that. And I think it's true for the SGU stuff too. And I think in that in the context of the shorter stories, it's kind of right sizing your plot for the amount of space you have. And so when we were doing the Atlantis outline, we're like, okay, let's treat each issue as an episode or each three, you know, every three books is going to be an episode. So we've got our beginning, middle and end act one, two and three, uh, which generally a three act structure is going to be more applicable to a film than a television episode, which is usually five or six, depending, and sometimes four, depending on what era mm -hmm. and where, where it was being broadcast. So the idea is that, you know, I, I just wrote a pilot, for instance, where the primary plot of the pilot is, can the main character get a date with the with the, a woman that he's interested in? Uh, but the show is about his passion uh, for building custom cars. You know, it's a complete, it's totally non-science fiction show. So you're doing a character piece. Yeah. Yeah. So you figure out, you figure out where you can do those things because, um, you know, Jeff and I've had other people tell me, it's like, if you look at TV, like basically from the time that SG one premiered in what the 97, right. On Showtime, something like that, mm -hmm. 1997. And then television today, the idea of the serialized storyline where the episodes are chapters now is common. It was very uncommon back then. So for Stargate SG-1 to say, we're going to have this ongoing interplanetary war situation going on with the gold, and we're going to stumble into the middle of it. They had the perfect mix. We actually cited this when we were kind of working on our, our, uh, our Roddenberry project, which was one of the best shows that we said, this is the approach we want to take. And our development person we're working with said, well, can you, do, what's another show that that did this well. And we were like SG one Stargate SG one did this well, where there's this ongoing situation, but then we still have these episodic adventures along the way. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what we tried to do in order to fit it in the space we had each time. So long answer to a good question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I have a question about 24. Yeah. On a, in a television show that is all to be fair, I never could get into it. I tried. <laughs> Just getting that out there. On a yeah. on a television show that is all about specific velocity, how would that translate into a medium that is all about the reader's own velocity? Okay. I wouldn't think that they would be necessarily compatible. And they weren't. <laughs> and when we did it, we <clears throat> when we went to do that, our original pitch was for a twelve issue series. Seven issue. What? The original was seven. No, not the first time we talked to Jeff, it wasn't. It was for 12 with two hours per issue. That was what we wanted to cover. And then they changed it. Remember? Because the well, when we, were... well the first one, the, the, the first thing in the conversation with him. Everyone is watching. We're old. We're, old. <laughs> now we're, 24 we're bickering because we don't remember what happened. <laughs> Then we adapted to the two, then we adapted to the two hours. But yes, okay. Then <laughs> then what we got slammed with in the first two of our one shots was two pages per hour. Oh. Yeah. This came down from the this came down from above our editor. Right. Oh. And because they didn't want to let the gimmick go. The time lock had to the time gimmick they wanted to carry it, over. It's, the, it's the, the identifying factor of the show. Right. Other than and so, Kiefer Sutherland himself. So, Jeff, were you to tell or were you want me to tell? I, yeah, well, <laughs> go ahead. No, no. You, if you had it, you had it teed, teed up. So. No, no, no. I, I just I just had, there's one one thing I wanted to say about it. It, it I wasn't able to express it at the time. <laughs> and it was, the, it to me. PG, it was, right? It was, 
mood is easier to insult than intelligence. Mm. And 24 or SGA or any show where it's it's so character centric and these great adventures, if you capture the spirit of it, mm -hmm. we as fans are going to go for it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, we're not. And we and got so if you if you get in, in 24, if you get locked into the the ticking clock, mm -hmm. well, yeah, ticking clock is absolutely integral, but the the whole 24 hour period isn't. If you watch this show as we have over and over, <laughs> there are episodes that are filler. Mm -hmm. We went to we went to um, those first where it was it was we wanted we proposed a 12 issue series at two hours per issue, then it went down to seven. You know which we were going to do and then finally as jeff said they got some numbers back on another licensed book that they thought would do well and it did horribly so then all of a sudden we're cut to 48 pages as you said it was it was the shield yeah the shield did not do well as a comic and, you know the shield shield was always getting great great reviews and everything like that but at that point fx cables in like 12 homes right <laughs> it won't necessarily so, translate yeah exactly and so what we did so what we did is we we, we went with their directive you know, we did, and we ended up doing three one-shot, 48-page one-shot stories. And the, the first one was actually called 24 One Shot, where Jack has one bullet left and he has to hold out for that period of time, <laughs> you know, because we were just, we were trying to make a point back to the editor. It's subtly, maybe not so subtly <laughs> now in hindsight, but the, uh, you know, the, the stories were well-received. Each one was re well-received enough for them to agree to do another one. There you go. And yeah. so... Would, <laughs> but the reviews were coming back and the fans were like, I really love this, but it was a little breezy, a little fast. And they were like, well, yeah, because we had to do this two hour thing. It's like, mm -hmm. as soon as you start getting into it, it's like, and Jack's victorious and he's done. And so when we finally got to, uh, we got third, the, the third one, the third one shot, we got to, we got to sort of go on our own directives. Okay. Well, it was more, it was more towards the six issue nightfall that we were going to do which is another example of we we got away from the time lock. So we were just putting the time stamp in the panel for wherever it was appropriate, but there was no formula for how fast it was going to go. But that was another example where we were told six issues, we had written four issues and we're working on the fifth and they're like, you have to stop it at five oh. because we're not going to do a sixth for whatever reason. And Jeff, Jeff, of course, this is where I I'd gotten, another instance where I'd gotten another assignment and Jeff had to finish it up of him, finish it up himself. And the end, again, people were like, this is fantastic. This is just like watching the show, except the end was a little abrupt. <laughs> it's like, I yes, called, it, yes, I it said, was. Can I have two more pages. Yeah. He, no. he couldn't even get two pages, two wow. extra pages. And, and, and literally, stuck. literally, <laughs> literally number four has gone to the printer. Yeah. And that's when we're told it has to end with number five. So there's no way to, to kind of yeah push it in, re yeah, replot it to, so it makes sense. And this was funny too because he told he calls and tells me, and the publisher had they had plans that they were going to do six covers that would fit together to make a poster mm -hmm. that they were going to hand out at shows, and uh, comic book shows. And I was like, how are you going to do the poster? And they ended up fudging it around, and it was just like the whole thing was weird. And and as far as Jeff and I were concerned. Mm -hmm. We were writing this to the point where it was like 2000 to 2004, I think we were we were working. That sounds on about this. right. And without fail, the books always arrived from the printer the week after San Diego Comic Con. So meanwhile, this publisher's got this huge spread. They're uh, publicizing their artists. They're doing uh, writer signings and creator signings. And Jeff and I are just standing at the yeah, because your, your product buying, is not there. Yeah, we're buying fifteen dollar hot dogs, getting all grumbly Jeez. and stuff. You know, <laughs> going back to the time, yep. the time um, there was one of the Stargate novelists. Uh, novelists always mm -hmm. put the location and the time at the beginning of every chapter. Now, the location I get because it's kind of setting the stage. You, you don't have to. Yeah. You don't have to write it into the into the into the pair the first paragraph or the first few. But the mm -hmm. time in the first couple of books, I was like, "This has got to be just relevant later on in the book," and I'm just not really. And it never was. It's like, oh. "Don't give me a piece of information 
that it's not relevant to the story that's going to be rattling around in my head when it doesn't when it doesn't materialize later. Don't put a right. shotgun over the mantle if you're not going to use it. Right, exactly. Don't inter- introduce introduce a bomb if you're not going to blow it up. That's right. You know, I just have always felt strange or about it, that. Or in the case of twenty four, at least say, "Where's the damn bomb?" <laughs> <laughs> Uh, before we wrap, guys, we had you had mentioned a little bit before we had uh, started, and you you mentioned mm-hmm. it briefly on air about a project with Roddenberry. Can yes, sure. can you yep. explore that a little bit in more detail? Yeah, Jeff, you want to take it away? Or? No. Okay, <laughs> I'll say that um, we we started working with them several years ago because they found us through our comic books. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they they had some ideas that they wanted to develop as comic books, um, and so they had contacted our publisher, and then we connected, and and you know as they say, one thing leads to yeah. another, and we got to a point where we were originally working, uh, we were brought in to redevelop some of Gene's old ideas, like we he was okay. going through his old stuff, so we were brought in and he had done a show with uh, a guy an actor named alex cord that people may remember from airwolf he was a character named archangel so he gave them all their assignments he was always wearing a white suit anyway he was he played a character on that show was um essentially an astronaut who's working on a suspended animation experiment and gets trapped underground and is woken up 300 years later to a completely changed earth um, and so we were brought in to kind of come up with a, a continuation or a reboot of that story. And we worked with them for a little while on that um, and then came back to find out that at that point, you know, that that story that Gene had done was developed first as Genesis 2, which I think aired on NBC. Then two years later, it was redeveloped again as a show called Planet Earth that aired on CBS. And then later again, it was developed with it this time without Gene's participation as a, an episode of a TV series coincidentally called Strange New World, singular. Isn't that and, interesting? Yeah. <laughs> and and it was the same basic gist of people from the past going through some type of either time vortex or suspended animation ending up in the future. Rip Van Winkle. Yes, basically. Yes. And it's, so he comes back. Yeah, every, everybody, uh, you know, um, you know, kind of ripping, <laughs> ripping homage to that story. I guess. <laughs> um, the... Uh, Yes, so they anyway, homaged it. They homaged it quite a bit. Exactly. <laughs> long, long story short was that by the time we came up with a workable idea, their lawyers had come back and said to determine the rights of who owns this and who would need to get paid to get all the rights back officially, it would actually cost more in legal fees than production fees to actually make it. Oh, so, gosh, so gosh. we ended up. Yeah. So we ended up. Um, I don't know if they felt bad for us because we, they liked what we had done, but then we just kind of pivoted into coming up with an original idea. And so what we came up with was a story that, that Roddenberry was looking for. They were developing a bunch of different things at the time, all with this kind of the brand, the Star Trek brand or the Roddenberry brand being mm-hmm. an optimistic view of the future. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of where you had to, where you had to land with it. And so we developed a, a TV series that set multiple centuries after, um, you know, a kind of not one single catastrophe, but, uh, you know, we have heard the phrase of death of a thousand cuts, mm-hmm. where basically our, our society as we know it now just crumbles under the weight of multiple small scale type failures. And the, the net result is a regression, a rapid regression of our, of our culture that we know today. Um, and then we flash forward to, you know, 400 years in the future, where descendants of, of people who were charged with kind of, you know, basically an IT staff at a company, you know, or at a government agency that was responsible for kind of monitoring the internet for various things, was, um, took it upon themselves to try to download as much human knowledge as possible. And so now... 400 years in the future, they are attempting to kickstart a second renaissance, second enlightenment and another renaissance, and this time trying to avoid kind of the mistakes that led us to where we were. Uh, and so what we end up doing is exploring exploring the earth in a where society has regressed into these pockets. So where they're the multiple, the, the kind of the different societies and different cultures that have developed in isolation over four centuries 
you know, what's happened in those areas. And so our team is going out and the technology, well, I can't, I probably shouldn't go any further than that, right? Yeah, Joe? I think yeah, it, it, we're, we'll <laughs> stop, we'll stop the details there, but uh, yeah. of, of one of the broad strokes and Mark uh, uh, crystallized this uh, pretty early on in the process is this, uh, what we're doing that is definitely on brand for Roddenberry is we're, we're talking about hope. We just described a very dystopic future um, where there are any number of permutations of not good things. Mm. Uh, so how do we apply that and uh, the Roddenberry outlook? And it's, and it really came down to succinctly hope is a choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not going to come to you from outside. It's going to come to you from within. You're going to generate that yourself in some way. And they like that, you know, as a blend with their optimistic view of the future saying, okay, we can have an optimistic view of the future, even when everything around you looks dismal, that you can say, I choose to be hopeful. And so we, you know, that kind of permeates a lot of the different projects that I work on. And, and, you know, it's interestingly enough, had had it pointed back that, that our Stargate stories that we've done have that in it as well. And, And that, that franchise, I think does, you know, to the most part, otherwise Earth. Earth would have reburied their gate early, early on in the series, right? <laughs> you just would not have dealt with it. No, absolutely. Yeah, and they tried. They tried. They were like, let's just shut it down and pretend this didn't happen. And then it's like, well, they know we're here now. So yeah, that's too not going to work. Yeah, it's too late. <laughs> that's really great, guys. Does this have a name? Um, it does, but we can't reveal okay. what it is. <laughs> not okay. yet. But we will. I like the premise. Re- I like what I'm hearing so far. Almost if there are like Thank different you. pockets of humanity on Earth, you're almost discovering different versions of human civilization now and where yeah, they I have told you we were on the right show mark exactly what did you say jeff i said i told you we were on the right show yeah exactly i mean that's the uh well and we and we you know there's there's a bit of of um a heavy influence of stargate you know in that respect in terms of what would happen from here forward rather than ancient civilizations mm-hmm. you know we're saying what would happen to our current civilization going forward and, you know, one of the things that we we kind of baked into it at the at the end, you know, and not not necessarily wanting to get into any kind of political uh-huh. discussions, but this concept of how do you know the news you see is accurate, you know, without some type of thing. And then that basically the idea is not to argue whether one side's news is better or whatever, you know what I mean? But the idea is that in the future, there's a suspicion of things that you don't witness for yourself, mm-hmm. you know? And, and well, so when technology we just, advances to a, a far enough degree. It's like, yeah, you just can't, you can't <laughs> assume anything anymore. Yeah. You know, because yeah, everything exactly. is, is built, uh, presented to you through a, through a, a predetermined lens through someone's opinion. There are cer- yep. certain things have to be shown first. Yeah. Who's yeah. deciding those things? Yeah, exactly. And certain so things will that... be omitted. So, <laughs> And so in the, you know, in our show, 400 years down the down the line, that has taken on, hmm. kind of, it's a bit of a legend. And a lot of people, you know, at that point in time, kind of credit that as what happened to the previous civilization. Oh, you know, they got, so they're they wary. To to this. Yeah, exactly. It, so, it, to, to, ver- to varying degrees, including superstition. Okay. And the, pos- the positive spin, the positive spin on is that, is that the, all of these cultures regardless of how they've developed in isolation over the years, place a huge emphasis on person to person contact and communication, you know, so well, that's, that's good. Yeah. So that's, that, I, I, I realized I left that sounding a little grim. And no, but I, it makes sense. So, yeah. I, I, I like the, 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 I'm on board. So cool. Keep me in cool, the loop. Yeah. Elizabeth yeah. Lee wants to wrap this up with uh, getting your contact information that you would like to share in terms of where we can, uh, uh, yeah. Get get the comics. Any particular uh, websites you would like to share? Your own personal websites, for instance, and I'll add those at the uh, at the bottom of the screen. Cool. Uh, well, for me, uh, on Twitter uh, is at Mark Haynes, M A R K H A Y N E S. Uh, my website is Mark Haynes Productions. That's plural. Mark Haynes Productions dot com. So you can see that's where I talk about oh, some other things I'm working on. Um, the Roddenberry thing is not on there, unfortunately, because they don't want us to talk about that sure. too much. Um, and um, well, don't tell yeah, them about so this episode. Oh yeah, exactly. No, 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 no. no. The and the um, uh, what was it? what was the other question? Um, Comic contact information oh, and where we can make purchases. Where you, where you can get the comics? 
off the top of my head, the best place to go, if you just want to read them, you can read them digitally at Comixology, uh, C-O-M-I-X, C-O-M-I-X-O-L-O-G-Y.com. Um, and then AmericanMythology.com uh, may still have some, but I don't know if they're allowed to sell it based on their- I name. can actually answer that part. Okay. Um, American Mythology uh, was pa well past their sell-off period, but- they went and bought some back stock that they uh, from uh, from retailers, so they do have some available. Okay, uh, and that's not AmericanMythology.com. I just checked. That's, I think it's, that's dot, not I available. Think it's dot net. Oh, is it dot net? It's dot yeah. net. Sorry. Yes, it is. No, it's all good. And <laughs> and uh, and so they've 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 reacquired some. Do you know uh, if they have the SGU trade? Because I, I no, I they, if they one. do if they do. <laughs> Listen, if they do, it's a, it's, it's very few, very small okay. numbers. So oh, you know, I would yeah. urge anybody that wants to get those stories to uh, go after the individual issues. Uh, I can also recommend mycomicshop.com. Uh, oh, right. I, do, I don't have any affiliation with them, but uh, they're a great mail order re retailer. Um, okay. Uh, for me, yeah, contact. The, um... Sorry, go ahead, Mark. No, no, I, was, I, I totally forgot the idea of going to... Um... Uh, both my comic shop, which Jeff yeah. mentioned, and also um, comicshoplocator.com. Oh, okay. To, to find a comic book store in your area that may have back issues or may be able to help you find them. They're not. They're not going to be new comics, and they're not going to probably be hugely available as back orders. But you know, as a last resort, if you're looking for a physical copy, that may be an option too. Okay. And I would start with Comicsology if you're just looking to read. And probably my comic shop. Now I will I will say on Comicsology, I'm not yeah. sure if they can still sell new stuff because that's oh. under that's under American Mythology's license. Oh, but that's like I said, point. I do know that they've got the I, but they still may be posted and they may still be sending yeah. royalties to MGM. I have no idea. And this um, is very yeah. complicated. It, it, it is. is. It's, it is. Well, this, is this is the license world. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Once you get once you get past the end of you've got like a what six months or a year six month sell off period under most contracts. Yeah. Wow. Okay. It's tough. <laughs> yeah. And so what American Mythology did was they went and bought some from people who who had who had purchased them. So they're actually they're actually at this point a reseller rather than the seller. <laughs> um, uh, and so just like any comic shop, they could continue selling those as as that were. Um, the uh, for a uh, contact info for me. Uh, Facebook, JC Vaughn, uh, or Jeffrey Vaughn, uh, the, my everything page is, is Jeffrey under, under my name. Uh, my writing is always under JC, uh, um, Facebook. I, I, that I know I'm on, I know I'm on Twitter, but I think he's on uh, Twitter. At, one, your, probably. your Twitter, your Twitter is at JC Vaughn one. Yeah. Thank you. I believe it took me <laughs> yeah, a minute to find him. Sounds right. What's that? <laughs> It took me a minute to find him, to be perfectly yeah, honest, yeah. but I found so, him. So <laughs> I have turned on I've turned on my notifications for Twitter, so I'm I'm on there. I've, I had turned them off for a while, and you know I think the at least people who are watching in the United States, I turned it off during the presidential election. <laughs> also, but it's back on now. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. All right, yeah, the whole the whole everything is just ah, just all of it go away. All yeah. right, guys, this is such a pleasure to have you guys on. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, tremendous pleasure. It's 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 an oversight of mine that I am glad to have remedied. Um, oh, cool. Mark, I'm really glad that uh, we yeah. bumped into each other at the convention. That's what these things are for. Yeah, it was great. So, it was great. <laughs> it was good to see you again. Too. Absolutely. And Jeff, pleasure to have you guys on. Hey, thank um, you very much. And I want to say not only thank you to you, but thanks to your uh, viewers for the good questions. Yep. yep. Absolutely. Yes, I am. And seek out very and seek lucky. out the book. Seek out the book wherever you can find it. And you know, if I'm if I'm at a show, I'm likely to give you what I've got. <laughs> if if you know, I, I I have a stack of SGU number ones, like about that big. So David, you know, if I need to find if somebody's really desperate for at least one issue, I, as a writer, I can't. I don't feel like I can sell an incomplete story. That's so true. That's why I resist. I resist selling them that's directly. True. But. But yeah, if you know people need help trying to find them, we'll we'll do our best to try to point them in the right direction. We don't and, have any and, to sell, and, but yeah. And as Mark mentioned, if we're at the if we're at the shows, uh, generally we've got some copies of our scripts too. I which... was about to ask because yeah. they yeah, I didn't know what <laughs> what you wanted to mention. So yeah, and, yeah, and, those, and that's... those unfortunately we can't do mail order. We have to do those as it, it in person events and things. Okay, but um, you okay. know that's. Uh, 
hopefully that might change. You know, we'll see. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, gentlemen. Thank you so much oh. for coming on to Dial the Gate. I really appreciate your time. Oh, man, anytime. Have us back anytime. <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, you know what? Uh, I Star Sky's the limit with Stargate. Who knows what's going to happen next? And I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, oh, and if something we happens. Oh, and have, we do have, uh, I think I mentioned at the very beginning, and this is hopefully at the tail end here, we, as I said, just this week have started work on a new Stargate project mm. um, that uh, we will be able to... D reveal more probably in a few weeks a month but i'll reach out to you david when we when we have something but it uh it should be fun i can't really say much more than that. i, I think we, i'd like what we i was say, hearing oh, cool. i think we could say i think we could say it it will involve GateCon. oh uh, yeah yes it will that, that's that we, would be uh, very nice yeah we uh we we like those guys and it mm -hmm. is our favorite place to go hang out and talk about stargate so uh, we're looking forward to seeing everybody there next year and hopefully giving them a little surprise. It's the best <laughs> fan convention that I know of. My it first really is. is still my best. It's my favorite. So I, yeah. I, can, I can tell you after, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've been a comics professional for 28. It'll be more than 28 years now. And the single best comic selling experience I have ever had at a convention was GateCon. Um, and you realize we're talking 400, 500 people of tops. Mm -hmm. And we had, we, we, we just, people kept on coming up and buying the books and talking to us about the stories and so much fun. It was just so much fun. They Phenomenal. Get it. So, so I, if, if there anybody, if anybody's on the fence about going, oh my gosh, please do try Absolutely. to figure it out. Even if, you know, it's like, even if you have to fly to Seattle and drive because it's cheaper than flying directly to Canada or whatever, you know, there, there's ways to get up there. So, so uh, yeah, keep in, follow the convention. And if you can do it, by all means. And we'll see you there. Yeah. Mark, Jeff, thank you so much, guys. <laughs> Thanks, David. Have and a good one. Take care of yourselves. See ya. Bye. Mark Haynes and Jeff Vaughn of Stargate Atlantis and Stargate Universe Comics. We'll be posting the links below so that you guys have uh, more of that information. Thank you so much for joining us. The sun's almost down here in Tennessee. It gets darker throughout the day as I do the show, and it's like keeping chasing the sunlight. It's kind of crazy. Um, that is most of what we have here for you. Let me see here. Okay. Dial the Gate is brought to you every week for free, and we do appreciate you watching. And if you want to support our show further, buy yourself some of our themed swag. We're now offering t-shirts, tank tops, sweatshirts, and hoodies for all ages, as well as cups and other accessories in a variety of sizes and colors through dialthegate.com slash merch. Click on a specific design and see what items are being offered. Checkout is fast and easy. And thanks so much for your uh, support. I did want to uh, show off a uh, specific new design that I created that I'm I'm rather tickled with. Uh, so everyone loves the system lords. So I went and uh, gathered up the the system lord artwork. And uh, this particular design shows each of their fates, how they expired. So <laughs> I thought that that was really cute. Um, so you got it in a gold version. You got it in a, a white version and a black version. Uh, and just go ahead and and pick which uh, design you want, which item you want, based on on which one that you pick. So, my name is David Reed for Dial the Gate. I really appreciate you tuning in. Uh, we're getting organized for our episodes for next week. That's going to be happening uh, announce announcing in the next uh, two to three days here, and that's what we've got. Thanks so much to my spectacular team for helping me pull this off. My producer, uh, Linda Gategabber Fury, my moderating team, Summer, Tracy, Keith, Jeremy, Reese, and Anthony. You guys are the best. And big thanks to Frederick Marcoux at Concepts Web. For, he's our web developer on Dial the Gate, and Jeremy Heiner, our webmaster who keeps the site up to date. My name is David Reed for Dial the Gate. I appreciate you tuning in, and you know what? We'll see you on the other side. Thanks so much, everybody.